Iowa. Hi. Welcome to Drinking the Kool-Aid. Welcome. I'm Megan. I'm Hannah. And happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there. Happy Daddy's Day. Mm-hmm. And I guess that means it's Hannah's birthday weekend. I guess. Summer <laughs> falls on a Monday, so. Wah, wah. Sucks, but, you know. Whatever. I'll still party it up. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Um, and we are, of course, still in Pride Month. And here's what happened. Okay, folks? Okay. This has been a story that I've wanted to cover for well over a year, but I hate it. Uh, okay. It's such a good story. Okay, it's so, so good. I de- okay, I know exactly what you mean. All right. But it's one of those that will just cut straight to the heart. And so I've been kind of pushing it off, but here it is. Oh, good. All right. So we're covering the case of Matthew Shepard, and I decided to use the book that his mom wrote, and it's called The Meaning of Matthew by Judy Shepard. That's cool, though, that his mom wrote it. Yeah, it gave a lot of interesting details that I didn't know, and she kind of mentions, too, that this story has been spun in ways that are not true, and I didn't want to put something in that's not correct. Okay. So that's why... So got why, it straight from the source. It's perfect. Yep, I went straight with her book, and it was awesome. So I highly recommend reading this book. It was really, really good. All right. All right. So with this one, um, we'll start off, you know, talking a little bit about him. So... Uh, Matthew Shepard liked to be the center of attention, but he was also empathetic and was able to feel what others around him felt. In the book, his mom says that the world knows him as Matthew, but he will always be Matt to them. So I am going to actually just use Matt. Okay. Wait, is this going to be a solved one? Oh, well, it's solved. Yeah. Okay. It's just bad. Okay. Uh, So when he was a kid, he wanted to lift his neighbor's spirits, so he actually wrote poems and drew little stick figure drawings for them, and then he would leave them in different mailboxes. That is the freaking sweetest thing. It's so adorable, but he actually had to change tactics and put decorated rocks in their mailboxes because he learned it was illegal to put unauthorized mail in there. Okay, but that's still (laughs) cute. It's beyond adorable little decorated rocks that's I yeah love it. just to lift their spirits i love it like a that kid would lift mine. Of that yeah at age seven he got involved in politics and so he would stuff envelopes for a local candidate and then he campaigned for an environmental group that was working to start a recycling program. At seven? At seven. Whoa, dude. Yeah, that's smart. Okay. Matt's mom, Judy, says that she knew her son might be gay at a very early age. And he did dress up as Dolly Parton for Halloween two years in a row. Nice. Um, when he was in elementary school. He loved to dress up and wear curlers at home, too. And it didn't matter what he wore, though. Judy said she just had a sense, like a mother's intuition. Yep. Because some people have been like, oh, you can't say just because he dressed up as Dolly Parton, that's what it means. And that's not what she's saying. Yeah, yeah. She just felt it. Judy decided to keep her thoughts to herself, though, because she didn't want to out her son. Love that. Right, and she didn't ever want anybody to treat him different. She also wanted to give him that space so that he could tell people his own truth. Yeah. So, awesome job there. Matt already kind of had a target on his back at school because he was overly sensitive. He was much shorter than the other kids his age, and he was having trouble academically and was diagnosed in high school with attention deficit disorder. Oh, man. Right. I feel that. (laughs) When he was in high school, he was voted peer counselor. So kids in his class felt so comfortable sharing information with him that they didn't want to, like, talk to an adult about. I feel like that makes sense, though, as, like, a kid that's, like, trying to just lift people's spirits with, like, rocks and stuff, like... Right. I feel like that just makes sense as somebody that ends up being someone that people can come to. Yeah, someone in that position. I agree. 
So his friends in school said that the best thing about Matt was the way that he made everybody feel like they were the only ones in the world at that moment. That's amazing. He had a way where he could like focus entirely on whoever's talking to him. Since he was so empathetic, it actually made things really difficult for him because his classmates would go to him and tell him all their problems and that he would worry so much about it and cry about the situations because he couldn't help everybody. Oh, no. Yeah, so he's like internalizing all of that. That's heavy. And he wanted to become a psychologist someday. So he needed to find a way that he could channel all of these overwhelming emotions. And he realized he loved being on stage. He craved that creativity. When Matt was finishing his sophomore year in high school, the jobs in Wyoming were kind of drying up. And it was clear that his family was going to have to move. His father, Dennis, had two different job offers, so one was going to take them to New Mexico, and the other was going to take them to Saudi Arabia. Wow. So that's That's kind of a big big, change. I was was, going to say those are huge differences, too. Like, yeah. Holy crap. (laughs) So Judy and Dennis were shocked when both of their sons jumped at the idea to move overseas. The company Dennis would be working for had a tuition program where the employees, high school kids, can attend a boarding school anywhere in the world. Oh, that's cool. It's okay. so cool. That is really cool. And Matt was already interested in a career in, in uh, international relations, Whoa. and he was taking German in school. Holy crap. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, His younger brother, Logan, was not in high school yet, so he was going to have to attend some classes near the compound, and then he could pick a boarding school when he was ready. Matt initially wanted to go to school in England, but there had been some recent truck bombings in the center of London, so his parents didn't know if this was going to be the safest option for him. It worked out fine, though, because Matt found out that Switzerland would have a lot of foreign language opportunities. So his new campus was going to be in Lugano, near the northern border of Italy. It was extremely difficult for Matt to be away from his family, and he actually pleaded for his parents to come get him. But they knew he just needed to stay there longer and try to make some friends. But how heartbreaking. It is really hard, though, like, to just be there alone. Right, yeah. The phone calls between Switzerland and Saudi Arabia were pretty expensive, so they actually had to fax each other, which it sounds so crazy old school, but they made it work. (laughs) Um, I mean, you do what you gotta do. Right, yeah. So over the next few months, the faxes from Matt turned into stories about the adventures he was having and all his new friends he was making. Oh, yeah. So they're finally feeling like, okay, good. He's settling in, you know? When he went home to Saudi Arabia, his parents noticed that he was now incredibly restless. Like, he always was looking for something to do. He also had a bit of a temper or attitude, and the compound just was not the place for him. In Saudi Arabia, all the stores close after noontime prayers for three to four hours, and then they reopen in the evening. Oh. Right. I did not know that, actually. I didn't either. So during the second semester of his senior year, the students were allowed to take a trip without a chaperone. Matt and a group of friends went to Morocco. And he just had an awful experience. Oh, no. Things go bad here. Oh, no. One night after a full day of sightseeing, the group returned to the hotel, but Matt just wasn't ready to turn in. So he walked to a cafe and had some cappuccinos with a group of German tourists. And this is something he does often. Like, he would just go out for some coffee, find random people to talk to. I mean, shit. (laughs) Right. Yeah. I would do it, too, if I could. (laughs) If I wasn't scared, everybody was a murderer. Right. That's really the problem. 
Well, when he headed back to the hotel, um, okay. I don't a like gang, the way you said this. It's not good. Oh God! Oh, God a oh, gang God. of men attacked and raped him. No. The men didn't take his watch, but they took his shirt and his Doc Martens. That is awful. Yeah. And the police actually did try to help Matt. So they believed him, but they were not able to find the attackers. Which freaking sucks. It's horrible. And Matt called his parents crying the next day. Oh, no. And said he was just so embarrassed and ashamed, and he blamed himself for this. Oh, no. I know. I told you, this is why the, it sucks so bad. Yeah. You know, there's different parts in here that you're like, oh, it's not your fault. Since it was going to take too long for his parents to come get him, the school actually arranged for a teacher to fly to Morocco and stay with Matt until he could get home. Okay, which that I love. is incredible. Yeah, so kudos to that school. But, like, think about that. Your kid's in Morocco and you're in Saudi Arabia. like. Ugh, what a nightmare. Oh, absolutely. Well, Matt's mom, Judy, said that he arrived home in Saudi Arabia three days after the attack, and they had him do a series of, like, physical exams, and then he was also tested for HIV. Which sucks because it's like, you just had to go through all of Yeah, it's so invasive. The attack, like, you and don't want to yeah. be involved in that. Yeah. Now, the tests did come back fine. He didn't have, you know, HIV or anything, but... Judy noticed that he had completely lost his confidence, his optimism, and his sense of purpose in the world. Oh, no. He started wearing really baggy clothing, like he was trying to hide his body. And then he lost all interest in acting. Oh, this is awful. Right. Uh, he didn't want people staring at him because I, it made him uncomfortable now to have people looking at him. The nightmares were the worst, though. Uh, he would wake up screaming and drenched in sweat. And his family took him to psychiatrists, and they said he was suffering from depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, and anxiety attacks. He was prescribed many different prescriptions, but nothing helped. And he hated therapy because he felt like he wasn't being heard. He interviewed many therapists and finally found one that he trusted, but the doctor died a month later in a car accident. Stop it! So it's like, Bruh. nothing's working no. here. No! Yeah. No! I, I actually, when I was reading the book, I was like, no! Oh, dude! Yeah. Matt graduated high school in the spring of 1995, and he had enrolled in a private college in Salisbury, North Carolina. This school was small, and it rank ranked among the top 10 theater colleges, and so he was, like, ready to get back into acting. Yes! And his parents were thrilled. They were like, this is a sign that he's, you know, starting to feel a little better. They got a call in the middle of the night one night, and it was Matt. It was 7 p.m. for him in North Carolina, but 3 a.m. for his parents in Oof. Saudi Arabia. Ooh. And his mom answers. She's like, what is going on? And he blurts out that he's gay. His mom says, what took you so long to tell me? Fuck yes. Which is like the best response yeah. ever. <laughs> and... She told him that she had known for a really long time, but Matt was not ready for his father to know yet. That's okay. It is, but it put Judy in kind of a weird spot here. So she actually did choose to tell her husband about the conversation because she didn't want to keep secrets. And right. they had both discussed that they were on the same page. Matt's their son. They loved him no matter what. So everything was fine. Uh, she just wanted to make sure that he was going to have the correct reaction to it. Okay. But they didn't tell Matt about this conversation. They right, left right. it at that. While Matt was at school in North Carolina, he started dating, but the relationship seemed to be kind of rocky, and he had some really shitty roommates. 
One of them was a Gulf War veteran who was six years older and homophobic. Oh, good. That's great. Good matchup here, right? Mm hmm. So I guess like this guy would say really nasty things and throw beer cans at him. That is terrible. Yeah. And his next roommate grew pot in the dorm, but that actually stressed Matt out too much. So he stopped going to classes. Well, I mean, that roommate doesn't sound so shitty. I knew you weren't going to care about that. <laughs> the The problem is, the first one is complete shit for treating him that way. Because even yep. if you think something different, you don't say nasty things and throw beer cans at somebody. Correct. But the second one, unfortunately, just wasn't the right fit for him. Yep. Because he's too nervous about the situation. Uh so he actually fell into what his family says is an undiagnosed depression over this. Matt did want to feel better, so he found an article about a therapist that was trying new therapy for PTSD. And it was about 150 miles east of where he was currently located. So he moved, got a job at a video store, dude. and started seeing the therapist. He's a proactive dude. Yeah, I mean, he wants something, he goes. Matt started exploring the gay bar scene when he was here, and he would wear makeup and flashier clothing. Yes, <laughs> Get it! <laughs> It didn't take long for him to realize that this was not the place for him either. Uh, he noticed that there was a lot of racism in the area. and yep, Not something you want to be around. No. Uh, he was, I guess, like, he even witnessed a Ku Klux Klan rally in Salisbury. Whoa. So he was like, I need to get out of here. And he ended up moving back to his hometown in Casper. At this time, Matt's brother Logan was now old enough to choose his boarding school. So he was leaving Saudi Arabia and he was going to go to a school in Minnesota. Huh. So, Not a great choice. <laughs> I don't know. We've got some good schools. I mean... We do. Yeah, well, I wasn't really talking about the school. I was talking about the state. <laughs> oh, yeah, for <laughs> sure. So Judy was actually going back to Wyoming to pursue a master's degree in Elizabethan history and U.S. constitutional law at Casper College. Whoa. And Matt was thrilled because he was now going to be living in the same city as his mom again. Dude, that is awesome. Yeah. So they each got their own apartment in the same complex. Yes. And everything was great. Uh, but unfortunately, Matt got restless again. And six months later, he decided he was going to follow a friend out to Denver. He felt that he'd be much happier in a bigger city. He got a job right away, but lived in a very bad neighborhood where, like, police would surround the block in drug busts on a weekly basis. Oh! So not good. That sounds so safe. Yeah. Um, but he had a plan, which was to gain residency in Colorado so that he could get in-state tuition and go back to college. Okay. So he was just going to kind of tough it out through that. The depression did not get better in Denver. Matt was prescribed anti-depression and anti-anxiety drugs, but the problem was he would forget to take them on the days that he felt good, and then on his yep. bad days he would take too many. That makes sense. Right. His mom did end up moving back to Saudi Arabia. Jeez, their family is just know, all, all over. over the place. <laughs> yeah, I know. And Matt started calling his parents to say that he was really unhappy. Oh, no. It was difficult to get around the city. He didn't like his job. And, you know, it sounds like normal stuff, but then he didn't show up for Christmas. He was supposed to fill out paperwork. You have to do that when you go visit Saudi Arabia. Okay. And then he did not complete it. Ooh. Instead, he spent Christmas in bed with the covers over his head. No. I know. Dude, you just like. I know. Over and over. Mm-hmm. Man. 
I know. I feel so bad. You poked my heart. (laughs) (laughs) I poked it. (laughs) In January of 1998, Matt's parents learned how bad things were actually getting with their son because they didn't know. Dennis's sister-in-law got a call from Matt saying that he was scared and she needed to come get him because he was in trouble. So Matt's aunt went to the apartment and found out that he hadn't been eating or, you know, bathing, and he hadn't left his apartment in days. Oh, no. Poor dude. I know. It was messy and smelled like rotten food. They later found out that Matt... This pisses me off so much. Matt tried to get help. He went across the street to St. John's Episcopal Cathedral... And so this was like across the street from his apartment. He asked them for help and they said there was nothing they could do and they asked him to leave. (gasps) I thought a church was supposed to help you. That would bring you straight down. Like a kid is asking for help and you're like, sorry, there's nothing I can do. Go home. I was really shocked by that. I hate that. Yeah. Yeah. So Matt's aunt brought him to the hospital, and then he was diagnosed with depression, and of course they gave him more drugs now at this point. In the spring of that year, he decided he was going to move again, and he moved to an apartment in Laramie and enrolled in school. Just cannot stay still. No, he's restless, dude. And I don't know if that has to do with you know, the awful attack and the things that he went through. Right. If that just made him so restless. Or yeah. maybe that's just his personality, you know? Yeah. In August of 1998, the family decided they were going to get together. Like, they were all going to meet up and do a family vacation. So they met in Casper, their hometown, and headed to Yellowstone National Park. They checked into a Holiday Inn for the night and would go to Yellowstone First thing in the morning. That was the plan anyway. Why vacation, though, when you can just apparently move there? (laughs) You just be moving everywhere. (laughs) Yeah. So in the morning, Dennis and Judy called Matt and Logan's room. And Logan's like, Matt's not here. He's at the police station. What? Uh Uh-huh. When Logan was heading to bed, Matt decided he was going to go to the bar for a while and promised he was going to be back in time for the trip. Everything's fine. Rut row. Well, the bar closed at 1.30 a.m., and the bartender asked Matt to join him and a few friends and said, like, they could continue drinking over at the lake. Oh, boy. While they were there, a man and a woman started making out, and Matt decided they needed privacy. So he asked the bartender, like, do you want to go for a walk? And the bartender said no. So Matt says that he kind of tugged on this guy's shirt and was like, we really should leave these two alone. And the bartender took it as Matt was making a pass at him. So he punched him. From him grabbing? Because he grabbed his shirt? Right. Oh, my goodness. It's utterly ridiculous. But I guess, you know, that's what Matt is saying happened. So obviously the party's over. At this point, and they brought Matt back to the hotel. But once he got to the hotel, he started having flashbacks of what happened to him in Morocco. Oh, crap. So he goes into the hotel and and goes up to the front desk and says, you need to call the police. I've been raped. Oh, crap. Right. And so he was tested at the local hospital, but they're like, we're not showing any signs of a sexual assault. Uh, He just had that bloody lip from being punched. Matt realized that he obviously had too much to drink and he didn't press any charges on the bartender. But now the cat was kind of out of the bag because his dad, you know, like when you look at the situation, it's like, okay, why would this bartender be thinking that you're making a pass at him? Right. You know? So Matt knew his father would think about this and wonder why they, you know, were flirting. And he had already told his mom a few years prior. So, you know, that he was gay. Right. Um. So he was finally able to say the words to his father, too, at this point. I'm glad he was at least able to tell him. Absolutely. Yeah. 
And Dennis made it clear. He was like, it does not matter. I still love you. Like, everything's good. Yep. Matt was super duper pleased about this reaction. I think it was just weighing so heavy for yeah. such a long time And it on does, him. yeah. Yeah. So he decided, he was like, okay, you know, I got a good reaction from my parents. So he started telling more family members, too. Uh, he told his grandma when they were in Minnesota. And she said she didn't know what all the fuss was about. If you're gay, you're gay. Damn straight. <laughs> I was like, yes, grandma. <laughs> Once Matt was back home, his parents found out that his landline phone had been turned off. They had been sending him money to pay all of his bills so that he could just focus on school. So there was no excuse for this. Uh, But he was clearly being careless and spending it on other things. His mom called his cell phone and they got in a huge fight, which was on a Saturday. Matt called his mom on Monday and apologized, and thank goodness he did, because... Oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. uh, Oh, no, 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 okay. His last words to his family were, I love you. Had he not called, that would not have been the case. Uh, I don't want... I'm not... All right. Okay. Yeah, let's just do it. It started with the dreaded phone call. At 5 a.m. on Thursday, October 8th, 1998. Judy and her husband, Dennis Shepard, were living in Saudi Arabia, still at this time. um, And he was working as a construction safety manager. They were used to getting a call at this time in the morning because of Matt. And the family and their family and friends were typically able to, like, calculate the nine hour time difference. But Matt just never could. So it wasn't out of the realm for this to happen. Okay. Uh, His mom said he kind of just lived in the moment, and when news happened, he's got to tell them. Yep. So the call, uh, when it comes in, it costs them $5 per minute, so that's why they have to, like, cut them really, really short. So Judy answers, and it was not Matt. It was about him. The man on the phone said that he was an emergency room doctor from Ivinson Memorial Hospital in Laramie. Judy said that, like, her mind went numb at this point. Yep. And Dennis grabs the phone and found out that Matt had been attacked. He sustained injuries to his head that were extremely critical, and his chance of survival was very low, and they were saying nearly impossible. Oh, my God. Dr. Cantway said, quote, Matt's wounds are so severe that he had to be transported 40 miles south of Laramie to a hospital in Fort Collins, Colorado, that was better equipped to deal with head injuries. Holy shit. Right. And the only reason they were able to contact Matt's family was because they found his University of Wyoming ID card with his emergency contact. Oh. Um, so... Matt's godmother was a nurse at Ivinson and had the family's contact information. So luckily that all worked Holy out. Holy shit. And they were able to contact or like tell them right away. And then now again, think of this. Your son has a very slim chance of making it and you're sitting overseas. Across, yeah. Like, yep. I can't imagine what that's like. No. I would never want to. And so it's like they said 8,000 miles away. That, oh, my God. And the flight to Denver by way of Amsterdam and Minneapolis wasn't leaving for 19 hours. No. And then it's so many. Oh. And they had to get documentation from Saudi Arabia to leave. Holy crap. Right. Dennis and Judy had to wait almost an entire day before they were allowed to leave there. While they waited, they, of course, started calling all of their relatives from the States so that they could make sure that Matt was not alone. Dennis and Judy waited the 19 grueling hours before they could begin their journey to Matt, and they stayed in constant contact with the hospital, but nobody could understand why he had been attacked. 20 hours after Judy and Dennis left Saudi Arabia, They landed in St. Paul, Minneapolis, well, you know, that terminal, to pick up Logan. And the family still didn't know the extent 
of Matt's injuries at this point. When the plane landed, they were walking past a newsstand and saw the New York Times and Minneapolis Star Tribune. Headline, gay man beaten and left for dead. Two are charged. Oh, my God. So the family got on a plane together (gasps) and headed to Denver. When the plane landed, the flight attendant passed them a note and told them to stay in their seats. What? Yeah. So first off, I just want to say, like, this is how they're learning about things is through a newspaper headline, you know? Yeah. Which is just horrifying. Beyond. And so once all the passengers left the plane, they were told that the press might be waiting for them at the gate and police officers were going to meet them outside. Fucking press. Right. And like at this point, they still don't know what's going on. They're kind of in the dark here. So they're like, why would press be involved in this? At the hospital, reporters were everywhere. It was complete chaos. They were getting so many calls to the room that the family had to come up with a password. It's just like fucking hell. You, you're in the middle of a tragedy. Right. Leave them alone. Yes, exactly. And so they're like, okay, we're going to, you know, use this system. No password, no call. But they did make an exception when President Bill Clinton called. Whoa. And, of course, didn't have a password. (laughs) I mean, I would probably make an exception for that, too. Well, Matt's father made the president promise that nobody at the White House would speak to the press about the call. Holy crap. Okay. Right. So he's taken charge. And unfortunately, a few days later, the Clinton call was leaked. Dennis called a man who worked as Clinton's liaison, and he tore him a damn new one. (laughs) Good job. And the man promised to get the news off the web, and he says that was a very memorable day for him. (laughs) (laughs) Love it. Yeah. (laughs) So when they got there, Matt's mom says that he was motionless, covered in bandages and tubes everywhere. His face was swollen and covered in stitches, and his ear was stitched and still bleeding. The man they looked at had no resemblance to their son that they had just seen a few weeks prior. The doctor informed them that he had more than 30 bruises, abrasions, and broken bones, including several fractures where his skull had crushed in on itself. This is awful. His brain stem, which controlled his heartbeat, breathing, temperature, and other functions, was severely damaged, and he had hypothermia. The damage to his head appeared to be the result of repeated blows with a blunt and heavy object. It was nearly impossible that Matt would ever come out of this coma. His parents mentioned that Matt had told them he wanted to be an organ donor, and You know, they were like, just in case, we want the doctors to know. Yeah. And the doctors were like, actually, he can't because he's HIV positive. (gasps) Right. Mm Mm-hmm. And they were able to confirm that it was very recent that that had happened. Oh, my God. And remember, he had been tested before. Yeah. And I have to imagine that when he said... He had been raped on their family trip, you know, when it wasn't true. Yeah. They probably tested him again at the hospital. So, interesting, hmm? Yeah. A neurosurgeon assessed Matt's injuries and said that the damage to his brain was so severe that he could no longer feel pain. And the family actually was happy about that that he can't part. feel pain yeah that he wasn't lying there in pain but yeah it's horrible it's just like yeah it's not good his family tried everything and i this is i really love this effort okay they tried everything to make him feel more comfortable they played his favorite music they sprayed his favorite colognes and perfumes around the room. Aww. And they would sit and talk to him about memories of him growing up. Oh, my God. I think it's such a good idea to try to, like, stimulate something in there. Yes. So, very smart. Matt had been discovered by Aaron. I think the last name is Kreifels. It's K-R-E-I-F-E-L-S. Okay. Uh, he was a student at the University of Wyoming. 
Oh, God, it was a student? Yes. Ooh. Yeah. Aaron said that he saw Matt falling, but he actually thought it was a scarecrow at first. And then as he got closer, he realized he was seeing a person on the ground. He was out for a ride on his motorbike and was rushing back to his dorm before dark. He hit a rock and crashed, and that's when he saw Matt, who was uh, unconscious, barely breathing, and blood was everywhere. Oh, my God. So Aaron took off running, and he went to the nearest home and called the police. When the police arrived, they believed Matt was about 13 to 14 years old because he was so small. And the rope that tied his hands to the fence was so tight, they needed a double-bladed boot knife to cut it. Stop it. This is so, so sad. I know. There was a pool of blood under his head, matted in his hair, and... Dude... There were tracks on his cheeks from his tears. Oh, my God. 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 Okay. And that's why this story Mm. always sticks so hard in my head, too. You just, like, shattered Mm -hmm. my fucking heart, dude. I know. His right eye was open and the left eye was shut. Sheriff's deputy Reggie Flutie said there was a gash above his right ear that was, quote, caved in and bubbled up on both sides with a film over it where it had bled continuously. So Reggie got there, and she tried to keep Matt's airway clear of blood, and then he was transported to Ivinson Memorial Hospital by 7.04 p.m. on October 7th, and that's when Dr. Cantway realized, like, this is not a good place for him. So he was sent in an ambulance to... uh. I don't know if that's Powdre Valley Hospital in Fort Collins. Yeah. We'll go with it. Sure. Sorry. (laughs) The police were tracking two suspects at this point, Aaron McKinney and Russell Henderson. They were both 21 years old and they were roofers that were cited in connection with another assault that took place early Wednesday morning, minutes after Matt was attacked. Detectives looked through Aaron McKinney's 1976 Ford pickup and they found a Smith & Wesson 357 pistol with an 8-inch barrel and it was covered in blood. They found a pair of shiny black shoes, which they later realized were Matt's, and they found an ATM card with the name Matthew Shepard on it. So this case blew up. In the media, and so many people were sending food, flowers, stuffed animals, and other gifts over to the hospital. Uh, It was so much that they actually had to distribute the stuff to other patients. So that's, you know, nice. I love that, though. I do too. I thought that was cool. Matt's family was stuck in like this hospital bubble where all they can think about is their son, and rightfully so. Yep. Uh, But they didn't really know what was happening outside. There was a candlelight vigil of about 100 people gathered outside the hospital, and then Matt's mom, when she learned of this, did actually slip into it very quietly because- Man, you just gave me a ton of goosebumps. (laughs) She wanted to understand what was driving people to be there. They don't know her son. They had no ties to this. But she realized they were driven by fear and anger. Their loved ones could have been attacked or they could be next. Yep. People took turns speaking and praying for Matt's recovery, and they wanted to get a bill passed to protect gay people against hate crimes. Yes. Right? Matt's parents wrote their first press statement on Saturday, October 10th, and it read, quote, First of all, we want to thank the American public for their kind thoughts about Matthew and their fond wishes for his speedy recovery. We appreciate your prayers and goodwill, and we know they are something Matthew would appreciate too. Matthew is a very special person, and everyone can learn important lessons from his life. All of us who know Matthew see him as he is, a very kind and gentle soul. He is a strong believer in humanity and human rights. He's a trusting person who takes everybody at face value, and he does not see the bad side of anyone. His one intolerance is when people don't accept others as they are. 
He has always strongly felt that all people are the same, regardless of their sexual preferences, race, or religion. Yes. We know he believes that all of us are part of the same family called humanity, and each and every one of us should treat all people with respect and digni dignity, and each of us has the right to live a full and rewarding life. That is one lesson which we are very certain we would share with you or he would share with you if he could. Fucking yes. That's such a good press release right there. Absolutely love every part of that. Yeah. On Sunday night, a nurse called the family to say that Matt's blood pressure was really erratic and it was starting to fail. They rushed to the hospital and gathered around his bed to say goodbye. His mom grabbed his hand and whispered, Honey, it's time for you to go home. Oh, oh, God. You just gave me goosebumps again. I know. I'm getting them all over, too. Matthew Wayne Shepard died at 12.53 a.m. on Monday, October 12th. The family had, um, had all had a previous discussion about what they wanted when they died. And Matt had made it clear so this happened, like, years prior that they had talked about this, and okay. Matt made it clear, like, he did not want to ever be buried. He wanted to be cremated and have his ashes distributed somewhere special. He didn't say where that would be, but, you know, he was like, figure it out. I want to go somewhere special. <laughs> <laughs> the charges against Aaron McKinney and Russell Henderson were now changed to murder. Matt had only been enrolled in his new school for about a month, and he joined a group uh, for, it was called LGBTA, Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender Alliance. He and other members of the Alliance had gathered on campus to make plans for Gay Awareness Week, and that was supposed to kick off with National Coming Out Day. One of the leaders, Jim Osborne, said that he had been verbally harassed on campus about being gay. Gay Awareness Week was supposed to help educate people at the school. Yeah. I think that's super cool. I love it. They were going to do like this lecture where they used a children's book and it's called Heather Has Two Mommies. Then they would watch a movie called In and Out and discuss safe zones that were going to be set up around the school. Oh my gosh. I just... It's really awesome, right? To like and that is really cool. Yeah, to you know, take the time to put up these events so that people can come and understand. So at this meeting, Matt was having so much fun and he didn't want things to end. So he begged the members to go to Fireside Fireside Lounge with him afterwards. But it was a weeknight. So they were like, you know, we can't. The members of the group didn't really know Matt yet, so they assumed that, like, the conversation over, they didn't realize how restless he was. That he was going to go, yeah. You know? And so they all drove together back to the campus, and then Matt snuck away and went to the bar alone. Damn it. I know. He was please drinking. Please don't. I just want to say please don't go out alone, just people. Don't. Please don't do it. Please yeah. don't. <sighs> he was drinking beer by himself and chatted with the bartender for a while. After about an hour or so, Aaron McKinney and Russell Henderson walked up to the bar and ordered a pitcher of beer. This stood out to the bartender. He remembered them because they paid for the entire thing with quarters and dimes. <laughs> nice. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Aaron McKinney had many run-ins with the law over the years. Uh, after he flunked seventh grade, he stole a cash register and went to a detention center. Two weeks later, his mom died due to a botched surgery. So Whoa. he ended up getting almost $100,000 from a malpractice suit. Whoa. Right. But he blew it really fast on drugs, jewelry, a sports car, and then he got a vanity plate that said dopey uh, because Whoa. he was small and had big ears, I guess. So oh, Okay. Yeah. All okay. right. That's a lot of money to blow. A hundred thousand. But it's probably because he got it when he was so young, too. Oh, my God. It sucks. 
So Russell Henderson dropped out of high school when he was 17, even though he was an honor student, a member of Future Farmers of America, and an Eagle Scout. Once he dropped out, he started hanging around Aaron McKinney, and he got arrested twice for drunk driving and arrested again for fighting with a police officer. Oops. Right. After the two of them paid for their pitcher of beer, the bartender said that they headed back towards, you know, like the back of the bar in the corner, and he is not sure how they ever came in contact with Matt that night. The bouncer saw the three of them leaving between 11.45 p.m. and midnight, and they all got into Aaron McKinney's pickup, and Matt was sitting in the middle in between them. Okay. Neither Aaron or Russell had a valid driver's license. Oh, wow. So that's great. Uh, They took a roundabout route, you know, in hopes that they wouldn't get seen and get pulled over. Aaron claims that Matt was hitting on him in the truck, grabbing his crotch, touching his leg, and licking his ear. But Russell said he never saw that happen. As they got close to a Walmart, Aaron announced that they were not gay and Matt was getting jacked, as he said. Uh, He ordered Matt to hand over his wallet and there was only $20 inside. Same. (laughs) (laughs) Aaron told police that he could not remember if he hit Matt first with his fist or the butt of the Smith & Wesson. Just the fact that he can't even remember disgusts me because it's like, you literally- That should be a significant event. Well, it's like, I know that he's obviously a shitty person, clearly. Yeah. But it's just like, you are so shitty that you didn't even care what the hell you were doing through that. Or he is totally lying. There's that, too. Yeah. One of them. But either way, shitty. Uh, But he claims that he hit Matt because he had been hitting on him. But Uh here's where this is entirely ridiculous. Russell admitted to the police that the two of them pretended to be gay at the bar to lure Matt into their vehicle. That's what I figured Mm -hmm. was happening here. Yeah. Aaron hit Matt in the face, neck and chest, and Russell kept driving about a a mile past the Walmart. They went down a dirt road, and Aaron drug Matt out of the vehicle. Well, you know what's the worst part? And and he's so small. Yeah. And not like a 13 or 14-year-old? Yeah. But, like, with the PTSD from the other attack, it's like, I'm sure he couldn't even... Hardly, you know, I mean, how do you even function at that point when you're going through it again? Right, exactly. So Matt did fight back and he was able to hit Aaron in the chest. But then Aaron knocked him down to the ground, beat him with a pistol and punched and kicked him. And Russell stood by and laughed. Oh, my God. Matt begged for Aaron to stop, and he tried to make a deal with him. He offered him money. He said there was about $150 in his apartment, and they could have it if they stopped. He gave them a fake address, but they did not stop. Aaron kept hitting him, and Russell grabbed rope from the truck. They tied Matt's hands behind his back, and then Russell claimed that he realized things had gone too far at this moment, And he says he asked Aaron to stop. Now, it's not because he was feeling guilty, so don't get this twisted. It's because he didn't want to get in trouble for it. That's exactly it. Yep. He knew that it had gotten to the point where he was going to get in serious trouble if it didn't end here. Aaron did not like being told to stop, so he hit Russell in the face with the butt of his gun. Aaron did also realize that he was probably going to get in a lot of trouble for what he had done. So he was like, okay, I am going to go talk to Matt. So he goes over to Matt and gives him false information about himself. He had tied him to a fence and told him that he was from California. Then he took Matt's shoes. He wanted to make sure that he would have a tough time walking the four miles uh, back home if he managed to free himself. Fucking time. Right. Dude cannot free himself from what you have done. Exactly. 
And just in case, we're going to make sure you don't get there. Yeah. When they were getting ready to leave, Aaron asked if uh, Aaron asked Matt if he could read the license plate on his truck. And unfortunately, Matt read it back perfectly to him. Oh, no, no, no. So Aaron struck him three times with the pistol, which crushed his skull, knocking him unconscious. And it was the three blows that put him into a coma and ended his life. No! Oh, Megan! I know. And that's where we're going to end on part one. I know. Dude! Uh Okay. Yep. Um, But in the next one, we're going to go in depth about what happens to Aaron and Russell. Um, and also how the nation reacted to Matt's death because it was a, like, people blew up about it. Okay. Um, I know this is a hard case. It is. You know, and it's one I've heard many times, but I'm glad that I got to go more in depth about, you know, finding out from his mom. Right. Uh, how things had gone for the years prior because there's so much more that leads to everything you know there is Uh, i just really yeah i know this one's a real bad one this is one of those ones where i'm like i don't even want to like discuss it more at the end because it's just like this one makes me feel like sick just it oh me too Yeah. yeah that's why i've been pushing this one off but i was like you know what it's Pride Month, and we do need to talk about it. Knowing it was a three fucking blows that, like... Right. Oh, well, my God. the way they tricked him. Like, can you read this? And yeah. then he does, not knowing why they're asking. Right. And, and it's like, you don't know how to answer. They could be tricking you no matter what. So. Yeah, you have no idea what the difference is, you know? Like, or what they're thinking. So it, it just sucks because, you know, what if he didn't read those back? I don't know. I think they still would have done something to him. I think they probably would have too. Because they are so shitty. So. (sighs) Okay. Okay. All right. So make sure to follow us on any of your podcast apps. Tell us the stories you want to hear. Like us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Leave us a five star review if you love us. Tell your friends. Tell your cats. Um, bye. bye.